Here we are at Walton on the Naze in Essex on a fine autumn afternoon. And what have we got about us? Beautiful air, water over there, and plenty of land here that I'm standing on. The three major components of our Earth. Let's have a concentration on the actual land that we're standing on. What's it made of? Well, it's made up of three different kinds of rock. First of all, you've got igneous rock, which is rock that has been laid down usually by volcanic action. For example, I'm sure you're all familiar with a piece of pumice, which you probably use to scrub your hands or your knees in the bath with. That was once molten lava, which is now solidified. That's an example of an igneous rock. Another example, probably familiar to you, is granite, which is used in buildings, in curbstones. You can see the speckled crystals of different minerals in there. Another example of an igneous rock. The other sort I want to talk about are metamorphic rocks. Now, metamorphic rocks are rocks which have been changed by heat and pressure deep under the earth. As an example, marble is a limestone which has been changed by heat and pressure into a crystalline form. Another example, but both of these come from Scotland, incidentally, is schist, where you can see the shiny flakes of mica in that piece of rock. Now, those are two, but the, the, the kind of rock that we are concerned with is the third kind, which is sedimentary rock. Rock that has been laid down as a sediment, usually by water, such as the sea. For example, here we've got a sedimentary rock a piece of beach sand with a modern piece of shell in it. You might not think of that as a rock, but that is just as much a rock in geological terms as any hard lump I've just shown you. Now, if we look over there at the cliff up there, we have got some layers of sand that were laid down nearly two million years ago. And I'm going to go up there to see if we can find some shells that were laid down on that beach at that time. Ah, here we are. This is just what I was hoping we would find. Up there is a beautiful band of fossil shells all the way along here. Let's go up and have a closer look and see if we can actually find some, 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 some good specimens. Well, this band here is mainly made up of very fine fragments. Here, a lot of smaller fragments. Here there aren't quite so many, but there are one or two bigger pieces down here. So if we perhaps concentrate on this band, we might find some bigger specimens. Ignore these holes up here, by the way. They're made by sand martins. Ah, here's a nice one. There's quite a nice big one there. As you can see, oh, you just touched that and it fell out. The sand is quite soft. And in behind it is a fossil whelk, this reddish-brown thing. Let's just see if we can ease it out. Shouldn't dig away at the cliffs because of the dangers above, but this one is only a small exposure. If we can just get that out. There we are. He fell down. But there we have a beautiful gastropod, which we'll show you in detail later. Now, what else have we got down here? Ah, down here is something even more interesting. Now, what we've got down here, if I can get this out, is a little stream running out at the bottom here. And in this stream has been washed out lots and lots of fossils. So that's the best place to find them. You don't have to go digging in the cliff. You can find all your fossils here. So down here, we have got quite a few more of these 
beautiful brown fossil whelks, all just washed out by the, by the spring here. Plenty of them just lying around there. In addition to that, we've got several other shells of different kinds just washed out. But underneath here, I don't know if you can see it, this, this gray color, this is what's caused the spring. Because if you look at this junction here, let's just clear it a bit. At that particular point there is the junction between the sandy beds above, which let water through from the rain, and down the bottom here we've got London clay, which is impervious to water. So the water can't go any further, which is why it comes out here and forms this stream, which has washed all these beautiful fossils out. Now, the London clay um, was laid down nearly 50 million years ago, or thereabouts. So between there and there represents a time gap of something like 48 million years, which takes quite a bit of time. Right, well, back up there, we found a whole band of fossils, and I collected quite a box full. But let's go down onto the modern beach and see what equivalents we can find living today. Right, well here we are on the London clay down on the beach with a modern pool with beach sand, shells and seaweed. Now this can perhaps provide us with a good example of what we mean by fossilization. Here for example, these two whelks they have both died and lost their soft parts. And just the hard parts are left there, which can perhaps give us a good idea of how things become fossilized. That, for example, has got no hard parts, so we can throw that away. That's unlikely to become fossil. But let's imagine a tide is coming in, and we're sweeping some sand over these specimens, and let's just wait until it clears and see what happens. Well, that one is still above the surface a little bit, but the other one has got completely buried. And these are what is, this is what is needed for fossilization. The specimens must be fairly rapidly buried so that it can be preserved. So that's one of the major conditions. But what else have we got in this pool here? Over here, for example, we have got a worm cast. Now, worm cast is not an actual animal, it's the evidence of an animal's activity. And in the same way, a worm cast like that, if it was preserved under the right conditions, could become a fossil known as a trace fossil. And over here, we have got evidence of man. We have a footprint of something like a size 10 shoe there left in the sand. Well, if a tide came in and filled that in with a different sand, and this got left for millions of years, that could conceivably become preserved as a footprint and become pre preserved as a trace fossil of, of, of a human. The London clay here contains quite a number of different fossils. In particular, shark's teeth are common along the shore here, but in other areas where the London clay outcrops, you can find remains of tropical fruits, you can find crabs, lobsters, gastropods, snails, and a number of other things. But this spot is known particularly for its shark's teeth, so let's see if we can go and find some. They're more likely to be found on the beach over here where the stony bit is. One beautiful shark's tooth from the London clay, about an inch long.
Right, here we've got some of the things we found at Walton on the Naze earlier. We've got some fossils and we've got some modern shells. But how do we tell the difference? You know, when is a fossil a fossil and why is that not a fossil? Well, the simple answer there is time and anything that is older or is found in rocks older than 10,000 years is regarded as a fossil. If it's younger than that, then it comes into the field of archaeology. Now these come from the modern beach and they are very clearly modern shells. These we know came from a deposit that was laid down nearly two million years ago, so these by definition are fossils. It's as simple as that. And anything from older rocks than that are fossils. Now again, well, that is how we tell when is a fossil not a fossil, but what sorts of different sorts of fossils are there and what can we learn from them? So, from the fact that these are, are very, very similar, and we know that this formed, uh, was, was deposited on a modern beach environment, we can assume or deduce that this was laid down under similar circumstances. So, first of all, by seeing what fossils we find, you can deduce the environment from which the fossil came. And this is confirmed by the fact that here we found earlier some very, very nice little sea urchins. Now, these might be quite small and difficult to see, but they are complete and perfect sea urchins. How do we know what they are and how do we know whether we can still find them today? Well, there are a number of reference books available, such as these books produced by the Natural History Museum in London, British Cainozoic Fossils. If we turn in here, we can see a picture of that particular sea urchin there, and from that we can find its name. Well, its name is actually Echinosimus pusillus, and we can see that its range uh, it goes from the red crag to the present day, which tells us that in the sea today, that sea urchin is still living. And yet, if we kind of look at this gastropod, we can compare it with the pictures here and see that it lines up with that one, from which we can tell us that its name is Neptunia contraria and that it was extinct uh, before the present day. So we can't expect to find living examples of that today. But let's have a look at a little more closely what, what else they can tell us, apart from their range. Here's a little shell that we found yesterday, which is obviously uh, part of a, a, a bivalve shell. And look at that little hole just there. That can tell us how it died, because we know by comparison with modern shells that this has had another gastropod or snail bore through that to eat the inside. So that died being the last meal of another shell. Here, for example, well, this one died and lay at the bottom of the sea and formed a basis or substrate for other animals to live on. There we've got some barnacles, there we have got some worms. So fossils can tell us about the environment and the conditions under which they lived. But let's have a look at a little bit more, more detail on how fossils are actually preserved. These are fairly obviously shells with just sand inside them. Many other specimens are formed in rock which has become quite hard. Here, for example, is a bigger shell where the shell is still present, there where the shell is broken away, and on the other side we've got solid rock there. Now that is known as an internal cast because that is the impression of the inside of the shell. So a fossil doesn't necessarily have to be the actual remains of the animal, it can be the impression of where the animal was. As another example, here for ex we have a complete test or shell of a sea urchin from the chalk. Now the thing is made up of individual little plates made up of the mineral calcite and inside if you look in the mouth and the anus you can see chalk inside. Now quite often in chalk deposits the chalk was replaced by flint and in this example we have a sea urchin which has got flint inside it and also in a nodule surrounding it but the original shell is still there and here we have another example where the flint from the inside uh, has lost all the shell and there you have a beautiful impression of the inside of the shell showing all the individual plates and that is known as an internal cast. In fact this particular shape is rather like a tea cosy and these are commonly known as shepherd's crowns or tea cosy sea urchins. But one of the magic things about fossils is that when you find something, you are the first person to have seen that 
for millions and millions of years. In fact, the first person ever to have seen it. So when we collected these, they had been lying there for two million years. This had been lying in the chalk or in the river gravel for perhaps many, many times longer than that. So this is one of the big things about fossils, that you are the first person to come across them. And it's, it's so exciting when you come across all these different things. And they can tell you so much about the environment. They can tell you a lot about life was, was like in the past. So. What, what actually are fossils then? And we, we've seen how they're preserved. What actually are fossils? Well, fossils are the remains of prehistoric animals, plants, or activities of them. So we've seen some shells. Let's look at a few, a few other animals with bones in them. Well, the, the vertebrates are divided up into five groups, of which the fish is the first one. Now here's an example of a very fine fossil fish from the lower lias, a complete specimen showing all the details of the head and all the scales. Now that's a superb find and looks rather nice mounted on the wall too. Earlier we were on the London clay and if you look here this is the sort of thing you can find in the London clay. Fish such as that one we just saw but here are part of the vertebrae or backbone of a fish when well, we found that shark's tooth earlier, there you can see a shark's tooth, and here we have the vertebra of a much larger shark. So those are some of the fish remains. Other, rept uh, uh, other groups of, of vertebrates are the reptiles. I'm sure you've all heard of dinosaurs. Here is a dinosaur tooth from near Sirencester in Gloucestershire. It's got a serrated cutting edge and a sharp point for cutting into flesh. Um, here we have the complete skeleton of a pterodactyl, one of the flying reptiles. They weren't all these giant things that people see in films. Some of them were quite small and were only as small as a, only the size of a sparrow. This one was about a crow-sized one, and you can see there the complete skeleton with every bone. This is the head, and those are the pointed teeth. Other reptile remains um, here, the, just the tip of a very large tooth from a marine reptile. This was probably used for catching something like squids and octopuses. Um, similar thing from uh, the chalk in Holland, a tooth of a mosasaur. Again, used very sharp for, for catching, catching soft prey. Uh, we come on to another group, the mammals. Here we have the tooth, one single tooth, of a modern Indian elephant. Now, the elephants had four teeth in their jaws at any one time, one up and one down either side, and you can see that they are adapted for grinding vegetable material. In other words, they, they, they used to eat plants. If we go back to the Ice Age, here we have the corresponding tooth from a woolly mammoth, which, as you can see, is quite a large one, quite heavy to hold, and this weighs something of the order of 16 pounds, and it's a lower tooth, and there will be an upper one coming down and grinding along, along it. Just imagine the, the, the thrill of discovering that in a gravel pit. Similarly, this is part of the tusk of a young female mammoth. How do we know it's a young female mammoth? Well, simply from the size and the diameter of it. That, 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 that's a young one. Here from the Isle of Wight, we have the lower jaw of a crocodile. This tells us that the conditions were a little bit warmer on the Isle of Wight some years ago, and there we have a scute or the dermal plate from the same crocodile. Now that leads us into something interesting because fossils aren't necessarily the, the actual remains of animals or plants. What they can be is the activity of those animals. Here, for example, we were just talking about a crocodile. This is the fossilized dropping of a crocodile, which was laid down on the Isle of Wight uh, quite a few million years ago. Here is the footprint, a small footprint, of, of a dinosaur which comes from Cheshire, and here we have resting trace and a trail of a trilobite, which is a, 
Uh, one of these, for example, is a trilobite. This is an arthropod that lived on the sea floor, floor millions of years ago. It's a bit like a modern woodlouse and had lots of legs which left all these impressions. So fossils are not just the actual remains of animals, they can be evidence of their activity. Right, now what do you think of this? There we have a slice of a fossil tree trunk which has been cut and polished. What happened? The tree died, uh, solutions containing silica percolated through the tree trunk in the sediments in which it had become laid down and eventually all the whole of the tree was replaced with silica. But a lot of the original structure in the tree still remains and here you can still see the tree rings and if you count them you can see that the age of this tree was actually 80 years old at the time it died and it probably lived around about 40 to 50 million years ago. It comes from Peru actually but the actual colors of the different forms of silica in it make it an extremely attractive fossil and that is one of the prizes in my own collection. A little bit nearer to home from the coal measures from which we get our coal here we have part of the bark of a tree called Lepidodendron and each of these little indentations here was where the stem of a leaf was attached. So you can find these in coal. Uh, going again a little bit further af afield, this particular fossil, you can see the stem there, is actually a fossil fir cone from Patagonia. Again, a long way away. But you remember earlier we were looking at the London clay and we found a few fossils there. Also from the London clay you can find fruits. Here is a rather nice fruit of what is probably a cinnamon tree and here, a little bit flattened but very much identifiable, we have the actual fruit of a fossil palm tree. Now that's interesting in itself because that tells us that when the London clay was being laid down in what is now England around about 50 million years ago, the climate was very much warmer than it is now because palm trees only grow in tropical to semi-tropical semi conditions. So that is useful as an indicator. Here again from the coal measures we have the growing point of uh, the internal cast of the inside of the stem of a, a fossil plant called Calamites. And this one is particularly interesting because this is from the Jurassic in the Cotswolds and it shows the leaf of a tree known as the maidenhair tree which is called a ginkgo. Now it was thought that these were extinct many millions of years ago but round about the turn of the century, in a Japanese monastery garden, some actual living examples of the ginkgo were found. And as a result of that, they have now spread under cultivation throughout the world. And here we have a, a leaf of a small uh, ginkgo tree, which I'm growing in my garden now, for comparison. The leaves will get much bigger than that, but there we have the old and the new. The significance of finding that really is almost comparable to finding a living dinosaur marching through Hyde Park. So this has given you a very brief introduction into what fossils are about. They are fun, they're exciting and to collect them can be one of the most fascinating things you can ever do. So how do you know where to go and how to collect them? Well the answer is fairly simple. First of all I would recommend that you go to your local natural history museum and have a look and see what they have got there. Having seen what they've got it gives you an idea of what to look for. It will also tell you where they come from and I would strongly recommend that you get a good little book on fossil collecting such as this one which not only tells you what equipment you need, where to go, but what precautions you must take. There's certain things, for example, you mustn't do like standing under a cliff hammering because for obvious reasons if rocks fall on you, you could be well on the way to becoming a fossil yourself. But the excitement is there, it is up to you to go out and ask questions and there are hundreds of people around ready to give you help in finding and searching for your own fossils and building up your own collection. Happy hunting.